If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me to a very familiar scripture. I've preached this message before here, 204, 209. I'm going to do it in 2018. I didn't know I was preaching today. It wasn't on my schedule. And I, I asked the Lord what to do, and I had five messages that I wanted to preach, but I felt like this is something he wanted me to go back to as a now a grandmother in the house and as a founding servant in this house what this rock and what this house and what our lives, Jim and I, have been built on. And so I want to go tonight to Mark 11, and we're going to be looking at the famous scriptures of Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, and 25. And it's going to be a very, very, very easy message. I'm going to give you three things tonight you can walk away with. Say it, pray it, and obey it. It can't get simpler than that. However, it's not simple. And it's extremely profound, the privilege that he has given us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven and as sons and daughters of God. Because Jesus came to reveal the Father to us and to reveal the kingdom to us. He didn't come so that we could be saved and washed in his blood, have great lives, and then someday we get to go to heaven. He actually came with a plan and a purpose. And it's all part of this divine master plan of God reconciling all things back to himself. And he is using Earthside, Jesus, the cross, and the church. And so every generation has the privilege of learning how to live by faith. As a matter of fact, we know in Hebrews it says that without faith it's impossible to please God. And those that come to God must believe that he is. That he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We find out that, there, that the kingdom of God is absolutely run, and, and, and it's, it's the economic system of faith, uh, of God's kingdom. It moves the invisible into the visible world. And you and I are not going to be able to live or to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in our lifetime for our purposes without faith. So Jesus came to model it. He came to reveal the technique, and he came to show and tell. And what I love about the Lord, what I love about him is so incredibly, immensely cool. I mean, he is absolutely demonstrating and then he is telling. It is show and tell to the children. And that is exactly what happens in Mark chapter 11. He's in his last weeks on, on earth before he goes to the cross. He's in Jerusalem for the last time. He's about to upturn all the money changers. He's about to make a whip and he's about to chase out all of the ungodliness out of the temple in Jerusalem. He's about to cause a lot of trouble. So much trouble that they're going to crucify him. But on his way from Bethany, where he is staying, which is a three-mile walk one way, it's early in the morning, he's hungry, and he goes and he looks for some figs on a tree that should have figs, which doesn't. So in Mark chapter 11... In verse 12, and we'll start with that. Now, the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. God wrapped himself in a human body. He experienced everything you and I will ever experience. He hungered, just like you and me. And seen from afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see it, if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Jesus said to it, he talked to the tree, he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. So we actually talked to the tree as if the tree had ears. An inanimate, living object, a tree. And his disciples heard it. So they went to Jerusalem, then Jesus went into the temple, began to drive out those who bought and sold the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares to the temple. He made a huge ruckus, and he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. So he rebukes them. He has a very, very interesting day. And the scribes of the chief priests heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. So here it comes. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When the evening had come, he went out of the city. He goes back to Bethany. Now the next day, fast forward to the next day. Here we go. Verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. 
And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree, which you cursed, has withered away. Now, I don't know about you, but that would have moved me. Here was a tree with leaves and no figs. You're watching the master talk to it. You're not saying anything. And then you go to the temple, and he throws everybody out, turns up the money changers, makes a big deal out of something that happened every day at the temple. Then you come back, and here's a withered fig tree. And he says, Lord, look, the fig tree. And now here's the show and tell. Because Jesus doesn't just do things. He does things to show us the Father and to bring us the kingdom. He doesn't just do this stuff so that you and I can have a story to tell in the 21st century. He is demonstrating the technique of faith and what it is he wants us to catch and the penny to drop so that you and I can figure this thing out. Because you see, there's a way of faith. There's a path of faith. There's a technique to learning how to believe God. In the church, faith can be a noun. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the tenets of faith. I believe that's a noun. But you see, living faith, now faith, is a verb, and it means it's constantly moving. It's constantly believing. It's constantly bringing forth that which is impossible into the realm of the impossible. It's bringing God's possibilities into the impossibilities of the human situation. And so we've got to learn how to do this. When Jim and I first got married in 1979, I didn't have the clue about the verb of faith. I only knew my tenets of faith and that I believed in Jesus Christ. I didn't know he was going to take me on a journey, and he was going to actually show me how that I can be just like him and the technique that he used and how he cursed that fig tree that the very thing that he did I can have and do in my life because as he is, so are we on this earth. He's the head, we're the body. We are the church of the living God in the 21st century, and we are to bring forth the plan of God, not just the tenets of our faith, but the plan of God into the earth realm, because you, my darlings, are it. You're the church, and he now moves through you for the people on this planet, and you and I need to know the technique of this, and so he shows it to us. He cursed the fig tree. He talks to the, to the disciples, and this is what he says to them. Verse, and I had a really cool joke, but I'm not going to tell it. You want to hear it? Well, it's not a joke. This is what happens when a woman preaches. Men are very focused, and they go from point to point to point. Women, you never know where we're going. <laughs> I just want you to know I want to be so full of Jesus that if a mosquito bites me, He flies away singing, there's power in the blood. Okay, that's it. Is that good? Is that worth it? All right, back to faith. Here we go. The fig tree, it was cursed. It's all withered up. I love how he talked to it. He didn't pray to God. Oh, Father, if it be your will. My, my Lord, there shouldn't be figs on here, but I'm hungry and there's not. And it was just... It was to serve me. So, Father, if it be your will, I just ask that you dry up this fig tree from the roots up. Now, I don't see that in there, do you? He spoke to the tree, and the tree dried up. And as they came back, they saw it. As he is, so are we. So this is what he says. Now, I would leave this alone, except he uses it as a teaching moment. And this is what he says to the disciples who wrote it down to tell us. He says... In chapter 11, and let's pack it, and let's unpack it. Verse 20, verse 21. Verse 22, Jesus says, have faith in God. Now, Peter says, what did you do? Look at the tree. And Jesus answers Peter and says, have faith in God. Now, there's a translation, Young's literal translation, which is the Hebrew And it says, have, and can I have that up there? Jesus answered and said, have faith in God. Can I have the Young's literal translation up there? Do you have that? Have faith of God. Did you get that one from my new PowerPoint that I sent you about an hour ago, and you may not have known I did it? Okay, you don't have it. All right. You don't have it? You can't move the screen up and down like, yes, I do. No, I don't. All right. (laughs) That's okay. Mark. 
11.22 in the Young's Living Translation. I'll read it to you. And Jesus answering them said, have the faith of God. So one translation says, have faith in God. And the next says, have the faith of God. And I submit to you that it's both. It's both. I am in the image of God. I was made in his image. And when I sinned and I, bought, I, was, I, I fell from grace through my parents and I was born into the sin nature, Adam and Eve, we lost that connection. We were dead in our sins and our trespasses. When we get born again, we become new creations in Christ. We are joined back up to the Father. That link, because death doesn't mean a ceasing to exist, it means a separation. So where I was separated in spiritual death, I'm now joined up because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because he's redeemed me, reconciled me, and now he's restoring me to full position. I am now able to not just have faith in him, but I'm to have his faith, the faith of of God. How he does things, I'm to do things. All right? Are, we with, are you with me? So let's see what he did. He says, have faith in God and have the faith of God. For he says in verse 23, for assuredly, I'm not kidding. I'm not messing with you. I've just showed you the withered fig tree. Now listen up, church. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever Whoever. Debbie Cobre is a whoever in the 21st century. A nobody old woman, but I am in the whoever. And what's your name? And if you're in the kingdom of God and you belong to him, you are the whoever. Says to this mountain, be removed. Now look, I just cursed a fig tree, but assuredly I'm going to tell you that whoever says to the mountain... Not just the tree, but the mountain, the mountain in your life, the mountain of trial, the mountain of testing, the mountain of sickness, the mountain of unbelief, the mountain of tribulation, the mountain that's in your life. Whoever says that to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. And then he says in verse 25, and, whatever you, and whenever you stand praying, now we're going to go a step further. I've told you you can move mountains. I told you you can ask God for anything you can believe for. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So here's a technique, and in here there's say it, there's pray it, and there's obey it. And in those three things is the technique in the life of faith. It's continuing in every situation that you'll be in. As he demonstrated the fig tree, and then he turns to the mountain... And he turns it from a fig tree to a mountain. He turns it to a problem. He turns it to a situation, a need in your life. This is how you bring that which is desired in your heart into what is actually going to be reality in your life. What is in the invisible realm that you cannot see will now be brought into the, invisible, into the visible realm where you can see it. And it's the technique of faith. So let's talk about the technique of faith for just a minute before we, we unpack this. Is that all right? Let's talk about how God does things. The, te the technique of faith is found in Genesis chapter 1, which we're not going to go to. And it's very simple, and I've said this many times to this church. The Father, the Word made flesh, the Son and the Holy Spirit are evident in Genesis chapter 1. Would you agree with me on that? And God said, let there be light. And the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, and there was light. So we see the Word, we see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, right? And God said, there's the Word made flesh. John introduces us to Jesus and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the word was with God. All things were made by him and for him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. Are you with me? All right. God the Father. Jesus is not God the Father. And the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. God the Father is God. He has a throne. He has a son. He has a spirit. They are three in one. But God the Father, A, in beginning, conceives the plan. The Word, who is one with the Father, commands the plan. The Spirit, which is one with the Word and the Father, creates the plan. Are you with me? So the Father conceives the plan. The Son commands the plan. The Spirit creates the plan. It is the technique that God uses. If you wonder, it's called mind or thought before substance. Thought before substance. How are things created? God thought it. God spoke it. God created it. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be, and he spoke, and it was created. Let there be, and he spoke, and it was created. We know in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith we know that the world was created by the invisible and that which was spoken. So God shows us the technique. The Father conceives, the Son commands, the Spirit creates. We are three in one, one Godhead in all creation according to Romans chapter 1, reveals the Godhead and the glory and the goodness of the Godhead. Now, that technique of faith, that the Father conceives, the Son commands, the Spirit creates, has now come into our lives because now you're born again. And that which was disconnected, dead, severed, separated by sin, when you come into the kingdom of God, and you are born again, what happens? Your spirit is joined to the Father. Jesus has redeemed you with his blood. He has reconciled you to the Father through his sacrifice, and he is restoring you through transformation. Are you with me? You're awfully quiet. It's, I'm okay. Am I? All right. Okay, here we go. This is technique. I mean, this is how he works. Now, if I'm made in his image, if I am the image of God, made in the image of God, and if I have God's spirit indwelling in me, now, if you fast forward to the New Testament, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, then I have a whole new methodology in which to walk out and flesh out my natural life on earth in this realm of time because I'm immortal, living for God, I'm in time, but I'm actually an eternal being. Did you know you're an immortal? Eternity's in your heart. You are sitting next to an immortal. Is that amazing? See, sometimes we don't think about this stuff. We just read this stuff and we think, oh, yeah, I'm a good little Christian. No, no, no. Well, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> but who are you? You're made in the image of God. You've been redeemed by his blood. His blood is so powerful that every foul thing that you've ever thought or ever done or ever thought was unforgivable is so completely eradicated and washed away that God doesn't even know about it anymore. You're cleansed and you're perfect before him in sight by virtue of his blood. And Jesus, knowing that he's going to the cross, is revealing these things to his disciples and says, listen, guys, there's a whole new system and there's a whole new kingdom that you're coming into. And you got to understand how to operate in this kingdom. And whatever you say, if you say to the mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart and you believe those things that you say, it will have to obey you. Because the works that I do, you're going to do greater works than these because I go to the Father. The blood, redemption, reconciliation, restoration. Now, let's fast forward. 21st century, here we are. We haven't seen him. We haven't touched him. We haven't been near him in the physical like they were in the first century. But he's more real than he ever has been. Where's church? 
And by faith, we came into this kingdom believing. We heard the word. We heard the gospel. Something in our hearts sparked, and it was truth. We went to the truth, and we prayed, and we talked to him, and he came, and he redeemed us. He saved us. Did anything in the natural change? No, but everything changed. Everything changed. And you were translated out of darkness, and you were brought into the kingdom of God. And now everything is new. But there's a technique. And we got to grow up because dad needs us to get busy with the family business. And the 21st century needs signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and a move of God greater than any move of God this planet has ever seen. And tag, you're it to believe it in and to bring it in and to have God use you for the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he wants to bring forth to this broken planet. So what's the technique? Well, it's simple. Say it. Pray it. And obey it. So simple. But so profoundly profound. Because it says in Philippians that God is at work both to will and to do his good pleasure in me. Therefore, now he writes his word on my heart. He wills his will into my spirit. And now as I begin to hear him and learn of him and love him and obey him, now I know what he wants me to do. And I begin to decree, declare, believe, pray, obey, and things change. That's how this church got built. That's how things happened in the supernatural in our lives. So let's look at it. Let's unpack it. And let's just go quickly because I'm, I'm pretty wordy here. All right, here we go. Say it. What does that mean? It means that Jesus said, whatsoever things you say to the mountain. I know that this has been abused and people have poo-pooed this idea. Boy, that's an old saying, isn't it? Poo-pooed. That's like from the turn of the 20th century. People have mocked it. I've been watching... Too much old television. People have mocked it. Oh, yeah, you're the say it, pray it, blab it, grab it, people. No, we're not. See, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because maybe there's been extremes. This is the truth. Jesus said your words are life. Death and life, it says in Proverbs, is in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, you're going to eat what you say. What you say is what you're going to have in your life because like God, you were made in his image and you have the ability to form words and you have the ability to image. And when you begin to decree a thing, be it faith or be it fear, it's going to come to pass. We create our own worlds. Listen, everything has ears. Everything on this planet has ears. What do you mean? Well, Moses spoke to the rock. Joshua spoke to the walls of Jericho. Zerubbabel was to speak to the mountain. Jesus spoke to the wind and the seas. How about this one? Jesus spoke to a man that had been dead for four days and said, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't think it. He said it. He spoke it. Sorry, I'm getting excited. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and he tells us, to speak to the mountain. So everything has ears. Everything around you. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, we have the same spirit of faith. The spirit of faith of Jesus. We've been given the spirit of faith. We have it. It's in us. We don't get more of it. It just grows as we use it. Every time the disciples ask for more faith, Jesus said, you don't need more. You just need how to learn how to operate your faith. There's a technique in this you got to grow up in it. We, having the same spirit of faith, according it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. I frame my world with my words. The message says words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. I will be justified or condemned by my words. Matthew 12, 37 says, for by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Don't tell me everything doesn't have ears. What's in my heart will determine what's in my mouth. 
Luke 6, 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Now, Jesus is using this truth because he knows how he made us. He knows the technique of the Godhead. God conceives the plan. The word commands the plan. The spirit creates the plan. I know that is so simplistic, but how do you make something so incredibly infinite and complicated as simple so my little finite mind can figure it out? That's as simple as I can make it. God forbid me. Forgive me if I've made it too simple for you. But just so you get a concept of this technique, God's in me. He writes his word in my heart. He conceives his will in my heart. Now I begin to decree his word out of my mouth. And the Holy Spirit that indwells me and empowers me creates and brings forth that which God has desired through my life. Technique of faith. So what's in my mouth will determine what's in my life. Now, I want to tell you a little story, and I hope this doesn't make my husband's heart hurt. But I had a situation last month, and I just wanted to buy Jim a, a better car. His car had a lot of miles on it. I shared this in Women Rock. And so I wanted to sell my car and buy him a, a newer car with less mileage, and I wanted a Mini Cooper. Now, he gave me a sports, he bought me a sports Mercedes convertible E-Class. Five years ago. Do I have a picture of it? It was a fine car. I, I liked getting in that car. And that pony could run. And that car was paid off and it had some money value in it. So I knew if I traded it in and got him a better car, that he would be, we would both be able to do more road trips because I want to go on the road with this man. So I sold it and we bought him a 2015 SUV that had less miles than his. But I didn't have a car, and I needed a Putz car. So in my heart of hearts, I wanted a Mini Cooper. Now, my husband could not believe that I would trade in a Mercedes E-Class convertible for a Mini Cooper. He couldn't believe it. He was incredulous and shocked. And so he loves to tease me. So he teased me, and he teased me, and he teased me. And he said, I'm not getting in it. I can't believe you did that. So I had the car. It was in the garage. I'd just gotten it. And I woke up in the middle of the night. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I went, oh, what have I done? What have I done? I sold my sports Mercedes convertible, and I'll never have it again. I ran out to the garage. And I opened the garage door, and there was this little Mini Cooper all shiny with racing stripes, little mini. And I went, oh, I love her. I love her. She's happy and fun, and I can cram all the grandkids in the back seat, and I can putz around. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, you know, you can talk yourself out of something, or you can talk yourself into something. Because death and life is in the power of the tongue. And just because somebody else doesn't think it's such a good thing for you, you wanted it, I let you have it, and now you're talking yourself out of it because of the words of your mouth, and you need to stop it because, you see, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Say it. You see, what you say is going to be what you have. You're going to create your world. You can talk yourself out of a relationship. You can talk yourself out of a good marriage. You can divorce a good man or you can divorce a good woman out of the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart. You can talk yourself right out of a great church that God planted you into and you leave it because you got offended, which we'll cover in a minute. You see, death and life is in the power of the tongue. And God says, your words create your world. And yet Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain and don't doubt in your heart and pray and speak those words of faith it will obey you you see our mouths are not made for trash and garbage they are made to decree and declare the will of god on the earth and the word of god on the earth so say it what are you saying and what do you have in your life the next thing is pray it because then he goes on and he says therefore now, I've told you about saying. I've told you about talking. Now you need to pray. Because the technique of faith is to believe and then talk to God about it. Now, Jesus talked to God all the time. He didn't pray to God about the fig tree because he'd already prayed. He talked 
to the fig tree. He spoke to the fig tree. You see, when you bend your knees to God in prayer, you will be able to stand up before anything in your life. No matter what comes at you, when you've already been to that place of talking to the Father, when you get up in the morning and when you got to go find your day and find out what's going to happen in your day and all the plans the enemy may have for you, it doesn't mean one thing because when you have been with the Father and you have his will in your heart, now you can do whatever he wants you to do. So pray it. So what does that mean? And I think sometimes we make the problem, and a friend of mine once told this to me, and I never forgot it. She said, sometimes we say it instead of pray it. We talk too much to other people instead of talking to God. And Jesus said, let's read this. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, What's Jesus saying? Well, I'm supposed to pray with permission. The prayer of faith comes when I have permission. Faith needs permission to move. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, there are times when you don't know the will of God. And you've got to flesh it out and you've got to seek God. And you've got to ask God and let him settle in your heart what is his will for you. But when that settles, now it's time to pray the prayer of faith. Now it's time to begin to pray what you know God has said you can pray for. And you pray it with permission because faith comes by hearing. And when you know it's the will of God, you're not going to doubt in your heart because now you are praying with permission and with passion. Listen, this isn't just a little cheesy throw-up prayer. Oh, God, bless my children. Bless us four and no more. Just bless us, bless us, bless us. No, I'm talking about getting on your face. I'm talking about getting the word of God. I'm talking about getting a flashlight if you have to or your cell phone. Now there's cell phones. I didn't have cell phones back in 1980. I just had a flashlight and a Bible and 2 o'clock in the morning with babies that needed to be nursed. And God said, use that time and make it your prayer time. And I'll begin to show you great and mighty things that I want you to do. But you got to have the faith to pray a man. It's hard to pray because you're talking to somebody you can't see. You can feel like an idiot, and the enemy's there to distract your mind. He's there to tell you you're wasting your time. But you see, and I had to get a blanket and put it over my head. I had to hunch down. Of course, I was in Lake Arrowhead, and it was freezing. I had to get all the distractions out So I could concentrate, and that's why I had my Bible, because I knew if I could pray the word, I was praying his will. So I started with really simple things and simple prayers like a child. And then as I began to pray, and as God began to drop in my heart his word, and as he began to take me on a journey and begin to show me, listen, child, I want to take you to verses that will show you my will. I want to give you Jeremiah 31, 16. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, says the Lord. Your work will be rewarded. There's hope in your future. Your children shall return from the land of the enemy. You see, he wanted to give me a promise that I could pray when my children were in the land of the enemy, and I could know it's the will of God for them to come home and for there to be hope in my future you see now you're praying the will of God and you're praying the passions of the Holy Spirit and now you are in sync on the earth with heaven and that cannot be broken and there's not a devil in hell or one loosed on this earth that can break the prayer of faith and stop the believer when she or he begins to pray and believe God and not doubt in our hearts we got some work to do we got some work to do. It's time to get to prayer. Time to take your Bibles or your cell phones, whatever it is you've got to take to read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, listen, my Father dwells within me. He wasn't alone. The Spirit of God lived in him. He said, the works that I do, everything I say, everything I do is because The Father's told me what to do. I've prayed, I've gotten instruction, and I've fleshed it out. I've done it. And this is how you're going to live your lives. Because when I go to that cross, and I break the power of sin and death over your lives, 
And I bring you into the kingdom. And I join you back to the Father. And I give you the kingdom of God. And all the gifts of the Holy Spirit now are yours. There isn't anything you can't believe for. And nothing will be impossible to you. But church, we live in the natural world. We listen to the natural voices. And the voice of faith and the voice of the Holy Spirit can become so dim in our lives. But God is stirring us up. He's shaking us, saying, children, children, wake up. The day's approaching. The night is beginning to shine. The sunrise is about to come. The Lord is returning. I need you on ready, and I need you ready with your gear on, and I need you to be able to march with me in faith and in prayer. So I need you to speak to that mountain. I need you to pray with faith not with doubt in your heart, and then I need you children to obey. Because you see, when you obey, it brings a confidence of faith that nothing can shake you out of. Nothing. Say it. Your words are life. Your words are death. Pray it. Go to the Father. You are his child. His throne is always open to you. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. The enemy will tell you how horrible you are, what you've just done, how you've just failed. How could you get drunk again? How could you smoke that dope again? How could you sleep with that person again? How could you get angry like that? He will rattle your soul. But you see, the blood washes it. The blood eradicates it. The blood removes it from your midst. And when you run to the Father and say, Father, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I can't believe I behaved that way. I'm ashamed. But forgive me. You see, now you're cleansed. It's gone. You stand before him righteous, holy, and ready to do his bidding on this earth. On this earth. So obey it. He says, and this is where the last one comes in. Verse 25. Oh, i got to put my glasses on. I can't see. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I'm, haven't I been yelling at you? I'm so sorry. Oh, God. Then I probably look all mean and old. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Obey it. i got to position myself close to God. You see, you can get close to him. You can position yourself for favor. You can position yourself for blessing. I have a friend, and she lives in another country. I won't tell you who she is because I don't want to reveal family secrets, but she has, she has some kids, and one child went astray, and it's broken their hearts, but this other child has just loved them, calls them every day is curious about their life and wants to be a part of it and wants to bless the parents. And so that child is naturally closer to them than the child that is in sin right now. And so they went on a vacation, and the child that was acting up said to the, the parents, you love them more than you love me. And the parents said, no, we don't. We love you both the same. But you have left us, and this child has positioned themselves close to us and close to our hearts and close to our desires. And so even though I love you just as much, they're positioned for favor. Do you understand? See, you can position yourself for success. You can position yourself to be close to the heart of the Father. You can position yourself like John did and leaned on Jesus' breast and asked him, who's going to betray you? You can get close to him. There's no barrier. There's nothing keeping you out. It's not like, no, no, I've got other kids right now. I'm, not, I'm too busy. God isn't, God's God. He's not us. He's infinite. And God says, listen, whenever you stand praying, you've got to forgive. Because if you don't forgive those that have trespassed against you, I can't forgive you. And if I can't forgive you, you're disconnected from the power because of sin. Are you hearing me? You see, the devil cannot curse you. You cannot curse what God has blessed. This is a principle in the word. Israel could not be cursed by Balaam. So Balaam had to teach Israel how to curse herself through sin. You see, 
You can't be cursed, but you and I can slip away, bite into the temptation, the unforgiveness, the offense, the wrong relationships, and we can position ourselves out of the favor and the blessing of God through darkness by going back to the old ways. And God says, don't do that. I need you to obey me. And the first thing he says is you got to forgive, which means whatever and whoever has done something in your life, you got to let it go. It is not worth you being out of favor with your father. It is not worth the blessings of God. I don't care. You know, Jesus told a parable. Oh, I'm out of time. He told this parable about forgiveness. He said there was a king, and he had a servant, and the servant owed him more money than he could ever repay, and the king had mercy and said, I forgive you that $20 million. You'll never be able to repay it in your lifetime. I'm just going to forgive it. That servant said, oh, thank you, king. Thank you. He goes out. He finds a servant that owes him 20 bucks. And he is so mad at that servant that he throws that servant into debtor's prison. Now, the king's attendants saw what had happened, and they run to the king. And the king says, well, throw him into jail. And don't let him out until he's paid all that he owes me. So that $20 million debt has just been redone. You see, in comparison to what God has forgiven us of, anything else is 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks. 20 million or 20 bucks? You tell me, is it worth it? Oh, no, it's not worth it. Forgive. How do you forgive? You release. You say, I'm done. I'm not holding you prisoner anymore. They didn't care anyway. They'd already gone on with their lives. You're the one in prison. So to get out of prison, get back into faith, get back into the blessing of God, you got to release the debt. Don't rehearse it. Don't curse it, forgive it, and move on. And even though you still remember it, sooner or later, it's not going to be such a hurt. It won't be such a horrible thing. God will heal your heart. I'm not saying you got to go trust that person again, but you got to release that person again and go on with your life. So what is God saying? Look, kids, there's a technique here. You can curse the fig tree. You can speak to the mountain. Anything you ask in prayer, believing, I will give it to you, but I need you. To understand this technique, you got to say it. Your words are life and death. You got to pray it. You got to know the will of God and pray it into the earth. And then you got to obey it because obedience is the confidence of faith. And this is the last scripture I'm going to use and I'm going to close. In 1 John, I don't know if you guys have it or not. 1 John, do you have that scripture for me? Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. We know, if we know that he hears us, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. You see, when you do what he says to do, when you obey it, you have confidence. I'm in the will of God. I've forgiven that person. I can go before the throne of God now, and I have favor with God. And I know that he hears what I'm going to ask, and I know I'm going to have it. Guys, there's a lot of work to be done on the earth. God wants to use this church. This little, piddly, San Bernardino rock church that nobody looks at and everybody thumbs their noses at, whatever. God says, I can use the foolish of this world to confound the wise. God wants to use you.